Today, we're going to rock your creativity. We're going to introduce you to Jean Peterson, who is one of the most creative people you have ever met. She's going to take you through some things that you've never thought about that will completely rock your world. I guarantee it. And you know, I don't speak lightly about those things. Jean, welcome. Hi, Eric. It's such a pleasure to be here. We're uh, we're excited. We're celebrating around here because Jean has a brand new video out with us. And uh, let me see if I can find it real quick. Um, it's called Mixed Media People. And you're going to see in a minute all the variety of the different kinds of artwork that Gene does. <clears throat> I'll show you a couple of things here real quickly. And it goes from very traditional to very non-traditional to really experimenting in a lot of different areas. And I think what you're going to find about Jean is that she will really help you push your limits in terms of your creativity. Of course, mm -hmm. we're excited that Jean's going to be part of Watercolor Live coming up, which is our international conference. But first, let's get back and learn more about what we're going to do today. Great. What's the plan? Well, first, I'd like to show everybody a little slideshow that I put together to talk about, I guess, my philosophy of painting. And so if I'm teaching or mentoring a group, I I uh, talk about these kinds of things. So first well, thing I'll tell you what we'll do, Jean. Uh, if you'll tell us what we're going to, you're going to show the slideshow and then you're yeah. going to do a little demo. Is that right? Yes, I'm going to do a demo, but I'm a, a little bit slow if I do wet glazing. So I pre-recorded myself videotape, uh, painting an eye last week. Oh, cool. Oh, and, uh, yeah. And perfect. we can talk, yeah, and we can talk about it and you can ask questions and I'm happy to answer anything at all. Uh, as as the video or the slideshow is going on. Okay? okay, so we'll get right back to that in just a second. I'm just going to make a couple of quick announcements, and then we'll we'll start uh, we'll start out with the slideshow, and we'll I'll be right back. Our guest today is Gene Peterson, and you are going to enjoy this. No matter what your medium, this is really going to rock your creativity. I think you're going to really enjoy learning more about Gene and what she does. She is probably the most creative. I, I, this is dangerous. I'll get in trouble. But we have a stable of two, 300 artists uh, in our Streamline Art Video Lilidol Creative Catalyst group. And uh, Jean is the one who always pushes the limits of creativity. They're all creative. But Jean is not stuck in one particular zone. I think you're going to really enjoy this. So welcome to day number 240. Three, we started this out. Day one was when coronavirus lockdown began. Uh, we we thought this was going to last two weeks. Here we are, day 243. Who knew? And <clears throat> so we're here for you every day. And we have been, if you're new, we have been doing uh, interviews and demos from artists every day at, at noon Eastern. And also at 3 p.m. Eastern, we've been doing segments from the well over 600 art instruction videos that we've created. And so you get an opportunity to really learn and grow as an artist. And we're here because we want you to stay positive and upbeat no matter what's going on in the world. You, you know, you have to stay healthy. You have to stay mentally healthy. And, you know, there's so much going on in 2020. We just want you to have a really great mindset. I was reading a, a, a note that my dad sent me this morning, and I'm blessed to still have my dad. He's, he's, uh, he's getting up there in years, but he's still his brain is, is better than mine, actually. And it, it was really interesting reading his note, and, and he was giving me, he always gives me this great business advice, and I'm very lucky to have a mentor like that. And, and one of the things he said is that, you know, with with COVID and with lockdowns and political stuff and economy and everything else, he said, I think you can anticipate, we've already seen a, a huge number of businesses going away uh, that we have seen, uh, you know, in, in our local town, for instance, we've probably seen 20, 30, 40 restaurants and small businesses. Lori and I uh, went out yesterday, we went to uh, went went by a couple of shopping areas, and we saw vacant stores everywhere that that were not vacant before. And so we, as a, an industry, we as an art industry, need to understand, or or whether you're in the art industry or not, we need to understand that <clears throat> we need these people, and that uh, as we gather for Thanksgiving, as we 
purchase our food for Thanksgiving, whether you're doing a small gathering or a big gathering, or whether you're following the rules, depending on your area or not, <clears throat> excuse me, we need to be supportive. I'm getting water. <clears throat> we need to be supportive of local businesses because if local businesses go away, everything suffers. So think in terms of local business as far as you're concerned. Most areas, most towns, most states have what they would be considered to be local grocery stores versus grocery stores that are nationally owned. Now, I'm not going to open up a can of worms here because I'll make somebody mad, but the idea is who do we want to make sure survives? If, if we had to make sure that somebody stayed in business, would you want it to be your local grocery store or a national grocery store? Would you want it to be a local camera store or a national camera store? Would you, you know, whatever it is. So, so I went out uh, uh, looking at cameras yesterday and <clears throat> I decided that on a particular camera that I really want to buy. And I, I went to a local store to see it. Now, uh, I'm taking pictures of, of, of model numbers and things like that, thinking, well, I'll just go online to buy it. And the, the sales clerk said to me, she said, sir, uh, we would really appreciate it. Yes, you're, you're going to have to pay sales tax if you buy locally, but we would really appreciate it if you'd help us stay in business by buying locally, you know, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. You've got to, you've got to make sure that you support the local, you know, there's locally owned businesses and there are nationally owned businesses. And so I want to make sure that we're thinking about that. So what I'd like to encourage everyone to do is to be supportive of local businesses. And you know who they are. And that, that includes local restaurants if you're in a position to do so. Now, everybody's a little bit concerned about going to restaurants during COVID era. And so even if it's a matter of takeout, we have some friends that own a, a local restaurant and, uh, you know, they barely are surviving. And, uh, you, you know, we're calling them and buying stuff and, and uh, supporting them wherever we possibly can. The other thing is <clears throat> to make sure that we uh, we help uh, a, a couple other people. First off, the ones we want to help are the art materials companies. <clears throat> Excuse me. If there are art materials that you love, this is a time to stock up if you possibly can. <clears throat> because we want to make sure that art materials companies uh, survive, and that includes people who make easels, people who make panels, people who make all the different things that that we use. You know, some of these companies are mega companies, and some of them are really small companies. But what would happen if your favorite brand of paint was no longer available? Well, you might say, "Well, I'll survive." That's right. But uh, I, so I've been thinking about this. You know, I thought, well, I think I need to order some of the materials that I normally buy or go and buy them, you know, wherever I possibly can. Uh, because first off, because we're going to go back into quarantine, it appears, I want to make sure I have plenty of paint materials, but also I want to be supportive if I can. So that's the second thing. And then the third, and maybe one of the most important is that we need to support artists. Um, artists buy from other artists. We have lots of data on that. And we want to make sure that we are supporting artists wherever possible. I'm trying to think about, you know, at the beginning of, uh, of COVID, we came up with a hashtag. I don't even remember what it was now. Maybe somebody has it and put it in the comments. But we had a hashtag so you could hashtag that and go and find local artists. We need to, uh, we, we all have social media followings and we need to be promoting the artists that we love and even suggesting to our friends who might not be artists, hey, if you're looking for a good, Christmas present, you know, I'm going to start posting some of the websites of artists that that I support, that I love. And of course, if you want to support my art, the idea is if we could do anything and everything we can to support artists, it's going to be really critical, right? Because uh, as my dad said, said, you know, uh, it, when he grew up in business, you could take a big phone book, remember those, a phone book, and you could rip it in half. You'd say half of all businesses fail within the first three years of operation. So think about all those people that go away. And then another half fail within the first five years. And then another half fail within the first 10 years. Only a small percentage of them survive. I started this business in 1986. You can do the math. And uh, I have almost gone out of business three different times, just barely squeaked by. I uh, Out of the 
the uh, let's see how many years, 34 years in this business. I've had other businesses, but in this business, 34 years and in 34 years, I probably uh, broke even barely about half of those 34 years and, and, and didn't make any money, just broke even. And that and, and probably 30 percent of those years, I didn't even take a payroll, a paycheck. You know, I'd take out a little money to buy some food once in a while, but it was just it was struggle time. And so and so think about what local businesses have to go through. You know, we don't really think about uh, what's happening in their lives, but what's the impact if they go away? So we want to support our local businesses. We want to make sure that people can survive and we all have uh, a little bit of purchasing power. So be thinking about that. I, I know this really is not a, all about art, but I want to make sure that that we keep that in mind because we want to stay positive and we want to help people. And we are an active community of artists and we, we play an important role. The other thing that's really important, and, and I don't want to tangent this, but uh, we, the artists of the world, are what people look to for inspiration and relief and stress relief and uh getting away from you know getting away from their realities you know there i remember a story charles white told me about a woman who who had a serious disease and she bought one of his paintings and hung it on the wall in front of her bed to get her through it and she said i looked at that and when i was in pain i looked at that painting every day and it helped me just kind of lose myself and get away from that pain that's the role that we play so we we play a very important role. That's why I want to keep you guys positive and upbeat, and not allow you to get all worked up about politics. You know, I I started getting into it again lately, and and I thought, no, I can't do it. So I started watching comedies on TV, and uh, you know, in my spare time, which I don't have a lot of, but it's really been fun, and I it's just making me feel better. So keep your head in a positive place. All right. So I've got a couple of quick announcements for you. Uh, first off, today I'm giving away a copy of my book to Teresa, Teresa, Trisha Lynn Bush from Florida. Congratulations, Tisha. That's Make More Money Selling Your Art. Uh, I'm also tomorrow giving away the great plein air apron. These are, are really terrific. By the way, any of these things that you see, uh, speaking of local businesses or small businesses who could use a little support, We've got a lot of Christmas ideas uh, on our website. Uh, you can go there and, and find it. Um, remember that, uh, you know, Thanksgiving's coming up and, and it's going to get busy. The end of the month will be here soon. So now is the time to enter for the Plant Air Salon Art Competition. There's 15000 for the grand prize winner and there's lots up for grabs. So make sure to check into that. Now, uh, if you want to look at all the stuff that we have to offer, just go to streamlinepublishing.com slash everything, and you'll find all of our events, all of our things there. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot of it today because I want to give Gene plenty of time, but I do want to mention that we have a fabulous event coming up called Watercolor Live. Gene will be part of it, of course, and it is the 28th through 30th of January starting on the 27th with beginner day. That's optional for anybody who's beginner. We recommend beginner day because it'll help you uh, understand concepts others are talking about. And so this is going to be a worldwide audience. We have people teaching from all over the world. Gene, of course, is from Calgary. And uh, we have lots of others teaching. So check out watercolorlive.com. If I have time, I'll tell you more about it later. Uh, today at 3 p.m., our video is Dawn Whitelaw. <clears throat> it's called Sketchscapes from Study to Studio. You're going to learn about her brown bag method, and it's absolutely fabulous. It's one of our top sellers, and she's a great instructor. You're going to see her paint this painting, uh, which is from this video. All right, now I'm going to get back to Jean Peterson. <laughs> Sorry, Jean, I had a lot to talk about this morning. It was good stuff. All right. So I'm going to pull up your uh, your slideshow mm -hmm. and and then uh, you can get that ready and then I'll kind of make it easy for people to I'll, I'll drop out. All right. All right. Here we go. Good. I thought first it would be a good idea to talk about uh, my philosophy of painting, I suppose. And it, it'll, it's fairly quick. Uh, but first of all, we're talking about watercolor, and we are going to have this big watercolor live event, which I am so excited about because there has been a little bit of a, a vacuum with regard to these types of large events for watercolor painters. 
So what you'll see today is just a tiny snippet of what I'm going to be talking about at the Watercolor Live event. We will go into much more uh, depth and uh, tell you a lot of my little secrets. But anyway, watercolor. Watercolor is a pigment that is suspended in a water-soluble solution. And I just snapped this with my iPhone and I thought, I have to use that, that's so good. So what are your intentions? I always go to what are your intentions? There are so many techniques and paints and surfaces to choose from and, and then you have to think about what is it that you are trying to communicate? So I put this little chart together several years ago and intentions to me is where it all starts. Uh, you talk about your intentions and I'm, I'm just gonna go a little further. What is your story? what is your idea and then when you know what your idea is what style are you going to communicate that idea in to your viewers and then from there you have to decide what elements of design and principles of design are going to help you to tell that story in that style so those are the things that i find are very very important here's an example of different styles I was up in um, Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories and I did a sketch of uh, Old Town and then I sketched it in several different ways just to show that you know, there's so many isms around and you have to decide what ism is yours. So would you like to be loose and gestural? And this is watercolor on Yupo, by the way. Do you want to be referential and emotional with some gesture in it? but not photorealistic. So this is more, I think, um, about the guts of how you felt about somebody and, and you know, really trying to come up with um, an attitude with your brush marks. Or do you want to be more classical in your referential piece, realistic, conceptual, local color? And uh, this was done with wet glazing. I do paint uh, wet in wet or wet in damp uh, on a vertical surface. Um, I paint a number of different subjects. So you can paint figurative or still life or flowers or landscape or abstract. It doesn't really matter. We're just using shapes and elements of design. Now well, this piece is uh, a water media piece. So I've used all kinds of acrylics in here and collage. So I just wanted you to see the difference between doing something that's kind of realistic with not so local color and an interesting background and how you can combine that together. Uh, and then um, we can talk about how to answer these things. Uh, so what is the story? This, this story of this particular painting would be the veneration of a man and his music. It happens to be my father who played the fiddle. Uh, how does the artist tell its story and what are the intentions? So this is a referential image with craftsmanship. There is a strong triangular composition to this piece. And uh, there was a simplicity of brush marks too. So uh, although this is realistic, it is not photorealistic and I don't show every single pore and hair. So any of those ideas might be what you're interested in. Now this looks kind of weird, this map, but if you see this particular piece over here, this is called Paper Rose. This piece is actually in uh, the um, Museum of Watercolor in Fabriano, Italy. Uh, and if you stay doing that over and over and over again, that's fantastic. I have a tendency to, okay, I know how to do that. I can do it over and over and over again. What would happen? What if, what if, what if? What if I add a little bit of gouache to it? What if I add some acrylic to it? What if I put some gold leaf and gouache in it? So each, it's kind of like, uh, traveling from Calgary to Texas and on the way I might go to the Grand Canyon and I might go to all these different places so all these experiences then will affect how I would paint the same kind of subject uh, but with different media so I just I wanted to share this as well all of your experiences whether it's travel or interaction with your family staying healthy all of those things impact how you're going to create your artwork Okay, so this is what I do uh, today for this demo. I'm going to be doing wet glazing, layering on damper wet paper on a vertical plane, so I work at an easel. I, I'm going to be trying to create the illusion of form. In order to have form, you have to have a light source, and then you have to be able to see shapes, the different shapes of values and colors. Now this is an example of how you might be able to see these things. So I took 
uh, a photograph of a lemon, and then I dissected it into all of the different layers of values that you might see in order to try to create some form. Now this is simple, it's only you know five values, but uh, it, I think it gets the point across, kind of like a printmaker. And there's my eye, I'm gonna be painting my eye. I didn't try to turn my eyebrows apparently, but that's that's okay. And there's the drawing that I did of it. I have a drawing here as well that I can show you. All right, so end the slideshow. There we go. There we are. Okay, Eric, I can't hear you. Ah, but now, now you can hear me. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so as soon as you're ready, I, I just wanted to come on while you were getting your camera ready and, and tell you that I thought it was so wonderful that you have such a variety in your work and that you're not you're not allowing yourself to be, uh, I don't want to use the word stuck because that works for some people, but to, to, to only do one thing. That's what I love is the fact that some days I want to be wild and creative and, and in different ways. And some days I want to be tight and realistic. Mm -hmm. Well, and you have to think about your, your personality isn't just one thing. Why we have is? a whole bunch of different facets about ourselves. And it's nice to explore those different facets when, when we're painting. Absolutely. Okay, so you've got your video ready? I've got my video ready. Okay, go for it. Okay, here we go. So this is, uh, I've got a few of my, my images for you guys to see. These are watercolors that were done with wet glazing and they're more traditional in their way. This is uh, mixed media with collage. Another mixed media or water media with collage. Watercolor only, transparent watercolor. And this is what we're going to work towards. So I start off looking at a map of the eye with the lights, middles, and darks. And you saw the photograph earlier of my eye. And what I'll do is I'll start layering, just like we layer. Uh, glazing comes from glass. And so if you thought of uh, glass that was uh, pigmented, as in stained glass. Now, some of this is quite speedy because this uh, painting the eye took me over an hour to do. So putting this video together, I sped it up in some places. I don't usually paint quite that fast, but I wanted you to see the whole process. So I'll start to layer and each layer will make the, the surface darker and it will neutralize the paint more. So the, the intensity of the paint will lessen with each layer. Now you notice that I'm lifting up some paint as well as putting down paint. And the best way to do that is with working with a natural fiber brush. So I do try to, when I see them, the Kalinsky Sables on sale, I'll pick them up uh, because I really like the way you can suck up the paint as well as lay down the paint. So there I have one layer of paint. However, it, you see two values. And I just wanna start exploring <clears throat> my lights, middles and darks as I put down the paint. Um, yeah, have you any questions so far? All right, so this is, uh, I, I'm, I'm actually starting with, I'm trying to paint this, this uh, particular demo with only three paints, uh, a warm and a cool, red, yellow, and blue, and they are transparent. Transparency in layering wet and wet many, many times is important to keep your colors clean and luminous. So I started with Aurelian, and now I'm going in with quinacridone gold. Those are my warm and cool yellows. The reds I used were quinacridone magenta and naphthol red. I do use uh, Holbein pigments. I find that they're, they're extremely pure and luminous colors. There's a lot of great paint manufacturers though, and you, you have to find the ones that work for you, but I find these are extremely uh, good quality. So the next uh, color that I'll put down is going to be in the reds. And you'll notice, there I started doing the reds, that uh, any area that is lightest will not get many more layers of paint. And so those areas will dry first. By the way, I did wet the front and the back of the paper because I want the surface tension to be the same on the front and back of the paper. And that way the paper will lay flat on my board. 
I traditionally will use a gator board to paint on because it's a light, hard foam. And uh, the, the paper will stick to it, kind of suction up to it uh, nicely. I don't pre-stretch my paper for a number of reasons. And I try to use some bulldog clips on the corners. Now, should the paper get a little bit dry, I can lift up the back of the paper and re-wet it, either with my brush or with a spray bottle. And uh, partway through this uh, demo, you will see that I have to do that in a few places. So this is only three layers of paint. And once I finish, that was quinacridone magenta that I put down. I try to use the biggest brushes I can for as long as possible, but I'm working on a fairly small eye, and so it would be very difficult for me to use uh, a one-inch brush. And since I'm talking about the brushes, I, for this demonstration, had a one-inch, a three-quarter inch, a quarter inch flat brush in Kalinske's, and then I had a 10, a six, and a two brush for getting into little details and corners. But I do try to use the largest brush possible for as long as possible. Now that's my warm red. That's my naphthol red, and I'm just trying to uh, shift my warms and cools and my colors so that I have repetition with variety. And you'll hear me say that a lot. All right, I put a little bit around the cheekbone and uh, the nose and so on because normally if I'm doing a whole portrait I can skip from one eye to a nose to an, the other eye and an ear and the paper will stay damp but the shine of it will go off and every once in a while you'll see me touch the paper and that's just so that I can see how wet the paper is. So I'll be adding some blue next and it might be a little shocking at first because uh, the last color that you put down is always your dominant color. So after I put the blue down, should I put some red or yellow on top? That'll be the dominant color. But now I'm starting to create a little bit more form because each layer gives me a darker value. And it gives me a more neutralized color. The paper that I'm using is Arches 140 pound. I do paint on hot press and Yupo, but for wet and wet, uh, wet glazing, I do use, you know, Fabriano Artistico or Arches or um, Windsor Newton 140 pound. I find that those papers are, are very nice, very lovely rag papers. Question about what blue that is. Oh, I'm sorry. Of course. That's a Thalo Blue Red Shade. And then I have a Thalo Turquoise. So I've got a warm and a cool blue. I also stay away from pigments if I'm doing lots of layering. Let me qualify that. If I'm doing lots and lots of wet layering, I stay away from uh, the sedimentary colors as well. Uh, because, well, I, uh, let me start with learning watercolor. And that was one of the first things that I learned in my artistic, uh, I guess, journey. It was the best education I could get because you're working mostly with the rawness of the material. There's not too much gumming it up. So if you see a raw sienna or an ultramarine, although it will have a flocculating agent in it, they will clump together and you'll get a granulation that's quite beautiful. But if you layer those over and over and over again, those, those pigments, they come from the earth and the earth makes mud. That's the easiest way I can tell you uh, to, to not overmix those sedimentary colors. And the same happens with the opaque colors, things like your cadmiums. Now, all of those ideas can be translated or transferred to your acrylics and your oils. If you understand and know the pigment quality, whether it's a transparent or an opaque pigment and so on, it will help you out in, in any medium that you choose. This is just fabulous. There's so many positive comments. I love your teaching. You're such a good teacher. I wanted to tell you also, you've got people from Austria, Latvia, Costa Rica, Vancouver, <laughs> up there in Canada near you, Brazil, and Israel. Wow. Thank you for joining us, everybody. I'm, I really appreciate you being here. Hope I see you at the Watercolor Live event. That would be 
terrific. So I've gone in with more magenta and really there's no order that I use over and over again. It's a matter of looking at what you've put down so far and determining whether you like that or whether you want to go a different direction. So right now, the eyelid creases are quite red because it was too blue before. Now it's too red. So every time I put another color down, uh, it will shift towards that direction. Now in my first book that uh, is called Expressive Portraits, Creative Methods for Painting People, I have a chart in there that shows you how uh, if, you, if you use wet glazing, you get a much, much different effect than if you mix the same exact colors in your palette and then put them on your paper. I find that if you mix the colors and put them on your paper, they end up feeling dull. If you layer wet and wet or on damp paper, you get a much more luminous, glowing, uh, interesting colors and slight little shifts here and there that I think are uh, interesting for the viewer to look at. I know that sometimes, you know what else is kind of interesting about this is uh, at this point, let's say that I'm, I have to run to a doctor's appointment or whatever, you've got to go pick up kids from school. You can let this dry completely, bone dry, and then you can wet both sides right under the sink and then put it back on your board again and nothing will run as long as you know your pigments and use this particular technique. So I think that's pretty cool. If I were to do that with Yupo, I, it would all run away. So knowing your materials, understanding them, and knowing what their strengths and weaknesses are is a really, really good thing because you can take advantage of those strengths and weaknesses and help to tell your story and communicate your best intentions to the viewer. Are there any questions, Eric? Uh, I don't have any questions now, but you guys can pop them into the comments. Uh, just everybody's loving it. A lot of positive comments. Mm -hmm. uh, New Zealand has joined us, Netherlands, Toronto. So you guys should post where you're from so that we know where you're from. Also, you can win prizes. But also, if you have questions, please speak up. Yes, it's. I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, and of course, I will be doing an entire face for the watercolor live, and we will go into more uh, more depth about how to set up your. Somebody model. asked, "What is Yupo?" Oh, Yupo. Good question. Yupo is uh, an artificial paper. It's a plastic-based paper, and so it works like a hot press paper the paint does not soak into it. So it's 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 a bit challenging at first, but once you get the, the hang of it, you can come up with some really interesting textures and marks, and you can lift up almost back to the white of the paper again. Um, my friend George James was, was a brilliant artist who used Yupo a lot and uh, painted some really stunning pieces using Yupo. Carlo O'Connor also is a fantastic artist who, who's really um, a master with uh, Yupo and gouache. So anyway, you can see that I keep adding more and more layers of paint and I'm just switching from those six transparent warm and cool colors and I build up the value. Did it dry between layers? No, no. If you let it dry between layers, um, I find you don't get the same luminosity. A lot of people do a traditional glazing, which is put your paint down, let it dry, put another layer of paint down, let it dry. Uh, this way, uh, there is a little bit of mingling throughout the entire process of uh, applying the paint. And it seems for me to keep a luminosity that I don't see in other ways. You can do that. There's there's so many techniques in watercolor. I, I just taught a, a little class called uh, Watercolor Workout, and I talked about all the different ways, different techniques that one could apply to telling their story. And what you have to do is try them and see which one fits your personality and the subject and the style 
that you want to paint in. And, and uh, at least if you don't paint in those techniques and you understand them, when you go and see uh, an exhibition, you will be quite impressed with, with how the different techniques are used to make you know, brilliant watercolors. Sounds like the next video we need to do. <laughs> sure, anytime. <laughs> what are you doing today? <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on how the rest of this goes. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think I mentioned before that uh, the actual painting of this, I took probably an hour and 20 minutes. So I've really condensed this into 20 minutes of, of video time. <laughs> And you can see that, you know, it is, it's a lot of layers and we're still not dark. If you held up a value chart to this, we're just barely in the midtones here. Somebody asked if you ever put wax on your watercolor paintings. And if you do, what, you, what do you use to adhere it to the board? Also, what surface board do you use? So I'm assuming they mean, do they mean for adding as a resist or do they mean as a way of sealing your watercolor? You know, I don't know the answer to that, so maybe you can answer both of those. Okay. Uh, a lot of artists in the last several years have started putting wax on top of their watercolor to seal it so that they don't require glass. And I do not use that. Um, it's not that I'm against it or anything. I, uh, I'm really, really open to doing whatever makes the best painting that you can, and that you know, if that's in oil, acrylic, mixed media, watercolor, it doesn't matter. Uh, and I, I think that glass can be problematic. But if I paint a transparent watercolor, I'm probably more likely if I'm going to put something over it, I'm more likely to put a, a matte or a gloss medium over it instead of the wax. And, um, you know, wax can have a few problems with, with heat and it can get dull and it can also scratch. Uh, and scratching isn't the problem, it just dulls it down and then you have to buff it every once in a while to bring back the clarity and the shininess of it. And um, of course you can use wax as a resist. So you can put it down with it on a dry surface, whether it's uh, white paint or uh, paper that has a lot of pigment on it. And you'll see that if you paint over top of it, the paint will not stick where the wax is. And John Singer Sargent and Winslow Homer did that an awful lot back in the day. So this idea of what is a transparent watercolor is a fairly new idea historically. In the past, they didn't have white paper and they had to paint uh, on, on a tinted paper and they used body color or gouache to add their lights. Some paintings that I've seen in museums, the gouache is thick, you know, almost a quarter of an inch thick popping off of the page if they were doing clouds or seascapes or whatever. So I, I think that uh, if we could be a little bit more open-minded to what a water watercolor can be, instead of uh, following all the rules that somebody told you about, uh, I think um, you know creativity and and thinking outside the box and thinking about what could be is exciting. And even if you don't want to go in that direction for a long time, like I said, if you go back to your traditional practice, then what you're going to do will be affected by the uh, experiments and the practice in other ways. And I think that's a good thing. It's, it's good to grow. It's good to push yourself. Someone said uh, Sergeant and Homer used wax to seal their paintings. Okay. To seal them too. Good. Yeah. I know that they use them as resists. So that's interesting. But you know, when you're out on the road doing plein air painting, um, Maybe, you know, maybe it was a good way to to make sure that it, they didn't get soiled. I don't know if they did that in the studio or, or out and about, but um, yeah, I haven't seen any of theirs in life that were sealed with wax, but uh, now I'll be in search of those. So you can see that uh, I'm getting a lot more value put into this and the colors are becoming less intense and maybe more natural. I do have a tendency to exaggerate a little bit with the color. I think it makes for a little bit more exciting image. Question is, do you ever erase your pencil lines after you've done your painting? I and do. Is that even possible? I didn't know. Yes. That. 
Well, that's a really good question. Thank you for asking it. I uh, have experimented with a number of different pencils, and weirdly enough, I find that the F pencil, Stadler F pencil, works really nicely for drawing and for erasing afterwards. Now, I do have the painting finished here, and I have erased the lines off of it. It won't be on the video, but I can hold it up after the video is finished to show you that you, can, you can't really see any pencil lines. I'm surprised by that because I just assumed that if you put an eraser on it, it would erase the color too. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's weird, isn't it? Well, that's just beautiful. All right, any other questions? Chime in if you've got questions. Yeah, now we're getting a bit of a kick of a dark. You see that? A few more brush strokes here and there, and the folds in the eyelid will be deep, deeper. So sometimes when I teach, I'll see somebody painting a blue eye, and they'll literally take the blue and paint the eye blue. And if you look at somebody with blue eyes, they're not all the same color all the way around, and they are not a pure blue. So my eyes are kind of, they're, they're different. They've got spots all over them, and there's layers of, you know, blue, gray, yellow, green. Uh, and so that's that's what I do when I paint my eye. And, and actually, I find that even if it weren't those colors, it looks more interesting than being one solid color. If you'll post the final painting uh, when we're done here, that'll be really helpful in the comments. Oh, okay. Okay. You bet. Okay, we're almost done. I think we've got another 20 seconds or something. So that's my demonstration of an eye as quickly as I could give it to you. Somebody asked, when do you think you're going to be able to come back to the States? Obviously, they want to take a workshop. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think it's going to be too long. I'm supposed to be teaching a workshop. Let me get out of this. I'm supposed to be teaching a workshop in Key West in February, so I'm really hoping that's going to work. Yeah, yeah. that would be nice, wouldn't it? There. there. Hi. Hey. Well, oh. fabulous demo. Let's see it. Show it. I'm going to get you on full screen here. Um. Have to do it the right way. There we go. Oh, that's beautiful. All right, wow. and you'll see that uh, I have some of my my watercolors up behind me. We have a little time if you want to show your studio. Oh, <laughs> this is my home place where I've set up a a Zoom sort of thing, and it's really messy. My I have a studio downtown in downtown Calgary in an old building that's about 110 years old. Okay. And it's set up quite nicely. I do paint here. And during um, during COVID, I did a lot of painting here because they told you to self-isolate. Right. So I've got this little desk right here. And um, let's see, you can see a sink over there that's really messy. Ah, I'm one of those abstract random people, and it just gets worse and worse the further away from what you're seeing. There you go. And there's an outside. You can probably see some of the snow out there. But uh, yeah, so this is my my little home space. Nice. Uh, yeah. Nice. Well, that's good. So have you got any other questions or comments for me, or what? What else can I tell you? Well, I think you should uh, just w while I've got you on here. First off, I want you to tell. I'm going to pull up. I want you to tell us about your new video. Yes. Talk about that. Absolutely. This video. Uh, one of the things that I like to do is mix different mediums together, and so this particular video is about simplifying the figure. I know that sometimes uh, people and faces can be a little intimidating if you haven't done that before. And so this video is geared towards anybody, but especially those who uh, might think, gee, I can't do a figure. And I, so I show you how to simplify the figure using ovals and triangles and squares and how you don't have to follow the colors and the values that are there. You can have some fun and balance your colors and think about, well, can I have a polka dot leg? Why not? And so should I then balance those polka dots somewhere else? Repetition with uh, variety. So you can see that there's some larger polka dots in her bodice, and then there's some tinier ones 
in her leg, and then you'll see other other things that are repeated with variety as well throughout the whole thing. And it reads as as a, a young woman sitting on a stool and just relaxing, being comfortable and thinking. I also did some writing in the background to uh, write about some of my thoughts with regard to the story that I'm telling in this particular piece. So we start with uh, collage and then how to add paint on top of the collage, how to come up with a, a simple design. And I even did some small maquettes with different colors ahead of time to show you different possibilities and then you choose the one that you like the best and apply it to your larger piece that you're working on. Can you explain uh, what a maquette is? Oh, of course. A maquette is just a smaller, a small version of what you might want to do in a larger format. And so would that be the equivalent to a study? Uh, yes, it could be. Uh, um, I think these were perhaps, oh, I don't know, maybe four by four squares that I did that were small maquettes. However, um, you know, some architects might do a maquette that's quite large in a room, but they're building an enormous building. And so right. uh, a maquette's just a smaller version. Okay. So you would do, when you're doing the small studies, you would do the mixed media and everything. It's not just a matter of just doing the painting. Um, I just did colors and values first. Okay. Uh, and, and then I put the uh, collage down and I ignore the collage and draw my design on top. And then I chose the color pattern that I wanted and applied that to the, the piece that you see on the cover. Okay. Now, so. next, I want you to talk to me about this video. Hmm. Um, this is your first video with us. Tell us about that. Well, this is the first video in a long time with us. You did some a long time ago. That's right. That's right. Well, this piece is a little bit more realistic. Again, if you go back to my slide presentation at the beginning, what are your intentions? Are you going to paint referentially or non-referentially? So this is a referential image. It's a little bit more realistic. There's the uh, feeling of form in this, whereas the simplified figure is very flat in the way it's it's approached. So there's two different reasons for painting each of these. This one also uh, talks, this is acrylic and I use transparent and opaque pigments and I use gesso and colored pencil collage in here as well. But at the end of the day, it's a little bit more realistic I'm, I'm not worried about it having the same colors that I might have seen in person. I'm using non-local color and, you know, just really having fun with edges and, and some shapes blending into others and where I can um, integrate collage so that it feels like it should be there. And then when you go up close, you'll go, oh, how cool is that? You'll see all kinds of little changes and shifts in both the surface um, relief and colors and values and textures. Okay, now tell me about this book, Expressive Portraits. Well, that was my first book, and uh, I worked on that uh, quite a few years ago because um, I, I've, I had won um, many, many awards with my watercolor portraits. And so the publishers came to me and asked me if I'd like to do a book. So this particular book would be really good for all those watercolors out there because I do start with the basics of watercolors, uh, the different types of pigments, how they layer, how to look for your value map in a face. I, I specifically uh, am focused on the face in this book, although all of the ideas and the techniques can be transferred to any other subject or style. A lot of books are like that. So if you just you know read it and say, how can I apply layering wet and wet to what I'm doing? Or how can I use these ideas of, of mixing a sedimentary pigment and a transparent pigment together in, in my work? So uh, I, I start with watercolor and then I move into gouache. You see on the front cover here, the background is kind of a gray green color and that is gouache. And I applied that gouache uh, a wet paint on a dry watercolor. So at first I was really searching for how dark can I make a watercolor? This, this was my, you know, 25 years ago. How can I make the darkest dark and still be luminous? And then I thought, how can I push my opaques as far as I can without it being, you know, dead? 
And once I had done that with the watercolor, I introduced gouache, which often has calcium carbonate in it, uh, at chalk, and that's what makes it opaque. So I, I did a lot of work with watercolor and gouache together. And then I moved from that to gesso. And gesso is an acrylic product that often does have calcium carbonate in it too, something opaque. And I started to use gesso rather than gouache because the gouache had its limitations. If you put it down, you pretty well have to, it's, it's hard to layer one on top of another. It's kind of like painting a la prima with oil. You kind of have to slide that next layer on and then just leave it. If you do more work with it, you'll start lifting up the paint or mixing it. So if I use gesso with that, then it dries as a plastic and it stays exactly the way I wanted it to be. So I started doing more mixed media stuff, watercolor and acrylic and then acrylic and collage and so on. So that it kind of makes sense if when I tell you why I'm doing what I'm doing. You're a wealth of information. I'm going to show this other book. Uh, this one's called Mixed Media Painting Workshop. Just give me 30 seconds on this one. Well, this one takes it a step further with uh, how to integrate different types of uh, mediums together. I also have included in this book other artists who use the concepts in different manners uh, to, to create their own work. So uh, it, it has a lot of my work and then it has uh, some of my, the people that I think, you know, do a bang up job with, with their genre. And uh, so if you're interested in acrylic and different types of uh, mediums and collage, this would be a good book for you. All right. Here is the, uh, here's a picture of the final painting, by the way. Right. There All you right. go. And you can see that I've erased the pencil lines. Oh, yeah. Wow. Like I say, you know, every day there's a new lesson. I had I'd never had heard that all yeah. these years. Well, I'm excited about learning about <clears throat> watercolor. I have, uh, I've decided, you know, if it's good enough for Sargent, I've always been an oil guy, but uh, I just am, as I get to this point in my life where I don't want to carry as much heavy gear all the time, I, you know, I'll carry it in the car. I'll, you know, I'll go backpacking with it, but there are moments when I want to have paints, but I don't want to take my my oils. And so I've decided I need to master watercolors. <laughs> and so I'm excited. What are you going to do on Watercolor Live? Well, I'm going to do a full portrait. Ah. So uh, so that you can actually see how to put the whole thing together. And it'll I don't know if it'll be a three-quarter pose or a, a full face. but and it'll, and it'll be in a realistic style? Yes. Yes. I, I want to talk about how to set up your model. So I've got my next door neighbor as my model right now. And I'm just going to talk about Vermeer light. And then I'll take that piece and show you how to make a map of where your lights, metals, and darks are. And then I'll start all this wet glazing. Exciting. Did you say Vermeer light? Yeah. Yeah. I just saw they had, the, they got the new film out on uh, uh, Van Megan, who was the guy who, who sold all the fake Vermeers to the Russia, to the, to the Nazis. And it's, it's really a fascinating, I've read the books, but it was a fascinating story. They mm -hmm. actually made him out to be a good guy instead of a nasty forger, which is mm -hmm. interesting. So it was pretty good. All right. Well, uh, Gene is going to be on watercolor live and uh, be participating with us. And that is coming up um, the 28th through 30th of January. And there's a beginner's day on the 27th and you'll get to see her full portrait demo then. Gene, this has been fabulous. This, uh, if you will go back into the comments later today, because you'll have tens of thousands of views by the end of a week, but go back in from time to time, answer some questions or uh, post the finished image. I think that'd be very helpful. Happy uh, to do that. Okay. Thank you for, for being a part of this today. Thanks for having me. It was really fun. We love having you. We'll have you back. Okay. All right. And we'll see you at Watercolor Live. You bet. Thank All right. Our guest today was Jean Peterson, and uh, she is going to be at Watercolor Live. I should tell you, uh, because some of you are tuning in for the first time, that Watercolor Live is an international, uh, basically, convention or conference or learning experience. Uh, it's virtual. Uh, we have instructors from all over the world. Uh, I'll just go through and talk about some of them real quickly. I won't give comments, but Linda Daly-Baker, Agnes Angus McCormick, McQuen, Mc, uh, I was, I'm screwing that up. I'm sorry, Agnes. Michael Holter, 
uh, Kim Machinko, Brenda Swenson, of course, Gene Peterson. Uh, John is going to be with us. Uh, Joseph uh, from Australia, Keiko Tanabe, Lauren McCracken, Mario, or Mario, I always get that wrong, Mary Robinson, Matthew Bird, Pablo Rubin. A lot of these people, a lot of them started out as actually as students of uh, Joseph Bookvich. Suni Warren, Stephen Zhang, Thomas W. Schaller. He posted something this morning on Facebook that just blew me away. One of the best pieces I'd ever seen him do. Uh, Andy Evenson, Daniel Marshall, Ian Stewart. I talked about Angus. Uh, Bridget O'Connor and Shuang Lee. So that's going to be Watercolor Live. You want to get signed up for that. The price is going up December 6th. It'll be here before you know it. You can save 100 bucks, And it's four days. And if you can't make the dates of January 28th through 30th, uh, try to at least make the beginner day on the 27th. If you can't make any of those, just know that your purchase comes with a replay. Different lengths of replays are available to you. And so you can check it out at watercolorlive.com. Remember today at 3 p.m., Don Whitelaw is going to be doing sketchscapes from study to studio, and we'll offer that video a discount today as well. So you check that out. You find all of our things at YouTube and Facebook. If you go to YouTube, search Streamline Art Video, but also hit the subscribe button if you would, please. And uh, if you're new to us, we have a free gift, 97 amazing, amazing painting secrets from the world's best artists. It's a two-hour video. Yours, our complimentary uh, streaming or DVD. If you get the DVD, you'll have to pay the postage, which is, I don't know, six bucks, depending on where you are. But uh, check that out, and I'll see you tomorrow at 12 noon. Uh, we're here on Facebook and YouTube every day. Just search Streamline Art Video. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazine. Thanks for tuning in today. And for those of us in the States, it's going to be Thanksgiving week. Uh, I will, uh, I'll come in briefly on Thanksgiving, uh, and I've got something special planned, but it's going to be very brief. And then, uh, and then I'll be here again Friday, but, uh, have some fun, spend some really high quality time with family. You know, this is a time when we really appreciate our families more than ever. We, you have to, I think I wrote about this this week in Sunday coffee. We have to make sure that we really show our appreciation because we just don't know what's going to happen in the world. So have a, a terrific day. Thank you for tuning in. Keep your head in the game. Stay positive, And I will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.